This episode is brought to you by the Fish Sauce RPG, Unleash the Power of Precision. Our RPG, Rod Positioning Gadget, is the ultimate tool for adjusting Scotty or Fulby rod holders. No more struggles or worn out tools, just smooth, easy adjustments. Elevate your fishing game and shop the RPG now. www.fishsauce.com And now we got a huge shout out to our next sponsor, Coldwater Strong. Coldwater Strong makes high quality gear for boat and bank anglers alike. From flasher bumpers and bank fishing leader kits to kill bags and bleed bags, Coldwater Strong has the gear to make you the hot rod in the boat or on the bank. Get your Coldwater Strong products at local fishing retailers like Bob Sporting Goods in Longview, Anglers Unlimited, previously Angler West in Woodland, and Fisherman Marine and Outdoor. Go visit their website at www.coldwaterstrong.com. What's going on, everybody? Clayton Dietz here. Thank you so much for joining us again for another episode of the WetNet Podcast. Tonight, I'm sitting here with Josiah Dar of JDAR Guided Fishing. Is that right? Yes, sir. Awesome, man. Thanks so much for coming on. We're going to have a blast here tonight. We're going to talk about a handful of different things. Um, first things first, as always, if you're enjoying what you're seeing, please like, follow, subscribe. We're on YouTube, Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, all that fun stuff. Um, I want to get into our giveaway, the Cold Water Strong giveaway. We're going to be restructuring that. So all the previous videos that you've seen on that, um, kind of, kind of forget about those. So previously I said that not one person was going to win everything. I've come to find out that's not quite a sweet enough deal. So we're going to sweeten the pot. Everybody that enters is going to get a chance to win everything that's in that giveaway. So the, the, the kill bag, the, um, the 18 inch finesse bumpers, the 12 inch bumpers, uh, flasher bumpers, excuse me. And the, uh, and the, uh, the kokanee gang troll dealios that he's got. Um, so in order to win that, I'm going to be making a new post. You go to that post, you're going to like it, share it and, uh, and like the wet net podcast page. That's all you got to do to win. And we're going to be announcing that winner here probably three, three Fridays from now. Um, I'll announce that here when we do the, uh, the giveaway post. Um, we're going to jump into some dam counts here real quick. Um, looks like Willamette Falls, we're looking at 136 to date, which is a lot better than the last podcast we did. I don't remember what that exact number was, but it's quite a bit better than it was. And, uh, and we're looking at 301 total over Bonneville. Um, Still a little late, man. Still a little late. What do you think? Uh, it should be a little better than it is, I would think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm I don't pay that much attention to the counts because I fish enough that I just sort of see what I'm seeing every day. Yeah. Yeah. But, for sure. Uh, I I think it's a little slower than I was hoping for right now. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. So yeah, I think we got all that stuff out of the way. Um. Take a second, introduce yourself. Um. Kind of your guide service, mm-hmm. and then we'll get into we'll get into more of it from there. Cool. Uh, my name is Josiah Dar. You know, I grew up here in uh, Scappoose. We're actually right on the edge of Scappoose right now. Um, here on the channel. Uh, this has been home my entire life. I uh, grew up fishing here. You know, it's kind of where I started. Little started fishing at all. Yeah. Uh, I used to run boat trolling around out here before I was old enough to drive. My mom used to drop me off at the boat in the moorage and uh, troll around and she'd pick me up when I was done. We'd catch springers and steelhead in the summertime. And this has just always kind of been home for me. And uh, <clears throat> it's a really cool place to grow up. I mean, you're, you got a door to the Columbia right here at the bottom. Yeah. You know, the Lewis is right there. The Calus isn't too terribly far downstream if you want to trailer down there. And, you know, if you get ambitious from where I'm at right here, I can run almost it's a little further up because there's a big no wake zone up here. Right, right. But I can run to the head of the channel or the bottom of the channel in just about the same distance. Perfect. Um, and if you want to go up to Davis Bar, you want to run outside, it's pretty quick going that way, too. So yeah. I can kind of go anywhere from here. Yeah. Uh, I, <clears throat> I would guess if I was going to try and run to like bachelor you know you'd have to go down that way to be quicker but if you were trying to go to caterpillar you'd probably be quicker going to the, this way and around so it's it pretty centrally located yeah yeah for sure you know i grew up probably <clears throat> as the crow is probably three miles that way so yeah i bet it's not even three miles yeah yeah so yeah we're uh we're pretty close to home i went to scapoos high school and everything and you know kind of right right in the backyard here um so let's get into a little bit of kind of your introduction to fishing you know as a child you know as a kid you know kind of you fishing this area obviously dive into that a little bit deeper yeah when i was little um my neighbor it's kind of funny my neighbor gary moved in next to my dad and i when i was probably two or three four years old little yeah and uh my dad didn't fish very much he didn't know a whole lot he liked to go but he you know he was only 24 or 5 you know and um 
you know, this is all pre internet, pre, you know, all the information sharing. Yeah. Well, my neighbor, who was quite a bit older than my dad, he'd moved in and he liked fish. Yeah. And he moved in across the street. And my dad I remember telling him, he's like, he was so excited. He saw the neighbor pushing in a fishing boat and getting all his rods out. And my dad was like, yeah, all right, cool neighbor, just gonna fish. And uh, my neighbor, Gary Isaacson, actually taught us a lot. Um, he, he took my dad a lot, him and an, another older guy named Tim Nikitin. Mm. They were friends and uh, they'd take my dad. And sometimes I'd go when I was real little. And then uh, my dad eventually got a boat and, you know, he and I kind of started to bump around and figure it out. And, and then, uh, yeah, shoot, dad's still banging around every day. He keeps his boat down there at Harlow's, the Coon Island there. Okay. It's been yeah. there. It's been there my whole life, most of my life since I was real little. And, uh, yeah, shoot, I've been going in and out of there forever. And now that I'm guiding, um, right now I'm running out of here. It's mm -hmm. easy to run out of here for now, but a lot of times Scapoose Bay or St. Helens, you know, meet a lot of clients at the courthouse down there and there's just a lot of stuff. Um, it's like anywhere. I mean, there's, there's great spots at Bonneville. There's great spots at the mouth of the John Day, you know, <laughs> but if you know your little spot, you can be successful. So you got your handful of areas in your spot and you just learn them real well and yeah. try and, you know, try and get the, try and get the water closest to home. You know, it's, yeah, it's pretty hard to be really good everywhere. Yeah. You just don't yeah. have time. Yeah, absolutely. There's some guys that do it though. Some guys that oh. just do it. Yeah. There's some yeah. extremely talented fishermen that I see all over the place. Yeah. I mean, um, just off the top of my head, you know, Shane Magnuson, you know, he's out there. Oh, yeah. Shane catches fish everywhere he goes. Austin Mosier is really awesome at being all over the place. Uh, Shay Fisher. I mean, Shay lives up there on the Snohomish. If they can fish Kings up there, Shay smokes Kings up there. He's down here catching springers here. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's, he's all over the board. Um, he's a really, really good fisherman. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Chris Turvey, I mean, Chris catches fish everywhere he goes. Yeah. And I've, and I've seen Chris, I mean, I've seen Chris absolutely everywhere I've ever been. I've seen Chris at some point. And yeah. I'm like, go away. <laughs> go <laughs> leave, leave me alone. Yeah, my, my yard, dude. Yeah. You know, go somewhere else. Yeah, but absolutely. No, no, and those are all awesome. I mean, the guys I just listed are all the kind of people that I love fishing around every day. They're all awesome dudes. So. Yeah, yeah. That's killer, man. Um, so tell us a little bit about your fishing background, not necessarily your childhood, but uh, kind of your intro to like guiding necessarily, you know. Um, what what made you make the decision to do it? What was kind of your, your introduction to guiding, so on and so forth? Um, that's actually kind of a funny story. I had, uh, I bought my guides license, my rowboat license for my drift boat. Mm -hmm. I don't know, 15 years ago when I lived in Tillamook, I was working for the newspaper in Tillamook and I was just guiding. I kind of got, I bought it because I had enough people that wanted to ask me to go and it wasn't very much for the insurance. It was cheap to just buy the rowboat license. And I had a nice drift boat because I worked for, um, Salmon Trout and Steelhunter magazine and then Nick, the editor, he introduced me to Jake, Greg, and Bruce, the guys at Clacker Craft. And so I had a crappy drift boat and we made a good trade. They helped me out. So I got a new one. And yeah. um, that was super cool. And I really, I really dug that. And I had a nice drift boat. I lived in Tillamook and I was catching enough fish. Um, and the thing that really helped me, my and say claim to fame, but the thing that catapulted my deal was I was doing that bead fishing thing and the bobber dogging thing before anybody was doing that down oh, there. Okay. I mean, when we first started and I was fishing the long leaders and the split shots and all that stuff with the beads. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, no one knew what we were doing. <laughs> Nobody was doing that. We were crazy, crazy, crazy good. I mean, 15 years ago, it was like, it was holy smokes good. And that was really right before internet really like blew stuff up. And it was before, you know, the addicted thing got really big. Uh, they started right about just right after I did, but like the information sharing just wasn't as big of a deal. Right. Right. So, you know, you could kind of not, I mean, the first few years, um, but I was taking guys for fun. Yeah. And we're crushing them. Yeah. Crushing them. <laughs> and then they just go out and crush them. Right. And then I was like, well, everybody's going to figure this out because I'm <laughs> taking people and I'm fishing with buddies and now I'm taking, then I've got a license and I'm taking clients and they're going out on their own and catching them. And then um, my friend, uh, well, Nick Amato proposed the idea of doing that popper dog in DVD. Mm -hmm. He says, you want to do this DVD? And I'm like, <laughs> not really but like at the same time if i don't do it i mean it's just i think i've been guiding like one or two years and i was like so this is gonna get out i right. can't stay forever i may as well be on the front edge of it yeah. Oh, yeah so i did that dvd and you know then that really helped everybody wanted to fish and learn you know when i first started and that really really catapulted my start for the steelhead fishing right um and then you probably don't know this. Most people don't know this, but uh, one of the guides in Washington had a little bit of a problem with his Astoria or as Astoria season. Well, I had went and got my license to run a six pack because uh -huh. I wanted to run a drift boat on my Minn Kota. Right. And I didn't own a sled. I had no intention of being a fishing guide and owning a big sled. Well, he couldn't run his trips in oh. Astoria, but he had the month of August booked. And so he said, take my boat. Yeah. He says, I'll make him. He, he made me a deal. Yeah. I ran his boat, his clients. I was, never tried it i 
frankly didn't even really know Astoria very well. I didn't know. I mean, most of the time I just went with friends and my buddies and we were fishing, but I always had a couple good buddies to bounce off of. Yeah. yeah. And suddenly I had uh, six guys every day for the month of August that I'd never met and I'd never going to meet them again because they yeah. were someone else's clients. And so I thought, well, what the heck? I'm just going to go as hard as I can and figure it out and try my best. Yeah. Sorry for the background noise. Yeah, <laughs> These guys cruising by. <laughs> as cool as my neighbor. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, Anyways. Yeah. But yeah, so we started rolling through and uh, it went really, really, really well. I had a great time. I loved it. And man, when I got done, I was like, dude, I want to be a fishing guide. I, I absolutely went, you know, 29 days or 28 days in a row or something like that. And and I, I just was like, this is awesome. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. And uh, I was still super excited and I wasn't all jaded and old and <laughs> weather beaten, you know. I was like, oh, the best fishing of the year, lots of fish, you know, Astoria, I'm good at this, great. Yeah. You know, and um, yeah, I bought a little sled and started rolling and that went really well and and uh shoot i mean we my first year we had two fish limits for the in the fall oh really out here in st helens the first year i actually think i actually had a my guide's license for my big boat and had a big boat on my own um i just bought another used sled and bought matt health this willy boat my first one and uh man we had two fish limits i literally figured out the pro trolling thing mm -hmm. um uh, tj hester <laughs> out there it was like telling me back in the day he's like dude you got to figure this pro toy thing out it's epic and i'm like no this is stupid <laughs> that, that looks so dumb yeah and that's why i made myself do it a couple days and i'll never forget i remember catching one yeah the first day and i went out with some friends and i got one i was like okay i'll figure this out yeah that's not really that good and then the second day i got three. Oh yeah and the third day I hooked like 16 oh shit. and i was like there it is <laughs> like i gotta go faster <laughs> yeah 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 you gotta so, get those things done yeah it just you know you're trolling the channel your entire life you're so used to just crawling along a mile and a half of an hour and going slow and feeling around and just putting them down 25 feet and hauling ass didn't <laughs> seem like but i figured it out and it, and uh yeah man that that really got it going um i worked for clacker craft and that really really helped because i was around people all the time mm -hmm. and around the shows around the industry um, besides writing for STS, I was just at the show. So I was physically with everyone all the time and talking to tons of people. Yeah. Um, and that was super cool. I mean, huge, huge boost. I got to do Angler West a lot because they sponsored Clacker Craft sponsored the show and I was the guy that worked there. So it was a kind of a no brainer that I do them and, um, had a couple really good Angler West shows. I got to do Grant's getaways with Grant McComey a couple times. Yeah. Um, just just had some cool opportunities come up and I just jumped on them when they came up and just kept going. I mean, I got lucky, but when it happened, I went for it and I, you know, I've actually had people ask me sometimes, uh, if, you know, especially younger guys have clients and some friends and say, I want a guide, you know, what, what should I do to get started? And I'm like, dude, go, Yeah. <laughs> you know, don't rely on it. Don't be married. Don't have a kid or family or a good job. I mean, it's, it's a lot, but you know, I think the biggest thing people, you really just have to go. And I, I just kind of went for it because I didn't have the, the like, tie downs or anything like that. And I didn't have a reason not to, it was like, what the heck? I may as well just send it. And yeah, and it just kept going. And yeah, you bump, you have days where I feel stupid when I was learning and I didn't know ways around or, yeah. you know, but I never crashed into a sandbar real bad. <laughs> you know, I never did anything really stupid. Yeah. So I, I feel like your best bet to, you know, just go, go for it. And it just kind of kept working and snowballing. And I, you know, stuff like this, every time someone comes up and wants to do something cool like this, I'm like, yeah, I'll go. What the heck? Let's do it. And yeah. That, yeah, absolutely. And, and that might generate another trip here there or, you know whatever and people want to do it and yeah i don't know man it's just been fun and i uh it's a tough it's a tough life it's not the easiest thing you got to travel and be all over the place and yeah. you know yeah well you got to deal with you got to deal with you know wdfw odfw sea lions fucking sea lions and yeah yeah I, I can only imagine the other one that kills you you know and i always laugh about this but people say you want to be a good steelhead fisherman or a good salmon fisherman and i'm like yeah it's pretty easy you just got to be a crappy parent a terrible <laughs> husband and a bad employee yeah I mean, it's yeah. just time man it's a lot of time and the guys that are the best fishermen out here typically day in and day out have spent a ton of time yeah i mean i i love him to death you know he's always really fun to fish around he's always super cool because a lot of the older gentlemen aren't necessarily the nicest dudes <laughs> in the world they've been doing it forever yeah. but terry mulkey uh -huh. he's always cool and and, and terry Terry's always, but like Terry can show up anywhere. If you see a hundred boats and there's one fish caught, no. Terry probably caught it. Yeah. And it's funny because he's done it so stinking long. I went on a guided trip with Terry Mulkey for my Christmas present when I was 12. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. We didn't catch anything. We oh, didn't catch a funny. single steelhead on the Wilson. And he laughs about it because he goes, hell, you're a lot better at it than me now. And I'm like, well, but it's just kind of funny. But, you know, that's, that's how long some of those guys have been doing it. And it's just that rep, the time. Um, 
I think the internet's really shortened the learning curve. Yeah, obviously oh, yeah. for everyone, yeah. you get platforms like Addicted and Salmon Trout Steelheader, and you know a lot, a lot of information out there. You know, yeah, the talent. You don't have to go figure it out on your own mm-hmm. as fast. You know, you don't need. I, I tell guys all the time, and I, I know it's self-serving, but if I had to do it over again, I'd have gone on more guided trips just to yeah. learn stuff. Yeah, absolutely. But you don't have to even do that necessarily anymore. If you have the energy, you can go watch videos and bump around and figure it out on your own and just go for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, there's some little nuances I feel like that I do and a couple of guys do that are a little different. Yeah. Uh, you asked me before we got started, you were talking about Cameron. Like, why is Cameron such a good fisherman? Like, mm-hmm. I've fished around Cameron a lot. He's yeah. a really good fisherman. He's one of the best <laughs> fishermen on the day in and day out. I mean, yeah. on average, he is top 5% of the top 5%. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just attention to detail, man. Yeah. Just yeah. really being focused. And you can be a screw off and laugh like I am and Cameron and chat and have fun and because you know where the little – tiny details are that you really still need to be paying attention to and you know sometimes you can do all that without looking like you're paying attention you know what i mean right right, right. yeah but uh and that just comes with experience you know you've been doing it so long it's just like muscle memory you know (laughs) just time uh the channel's not really any different um we're talking about fishing the channel a lot and Mm -hmm. kind of just as like a um i don't know a little segue to it but like this thing is you do the right thing Mm -hmm. the thing that you know is right and you put in the time because this sucker is hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's snaggy and gross. <laughs> it's snaggy and gross. But you know what I also do is I don't, you know, the first four or five trips of the year this year, I snagged up a lot. And yeah. I don't think I got hung up more than once or twice the last couple trips. Right. right. And, you know, I kind of remember where they are. Yeah. At least the bad ones. I still, pay, you know, and most of the time I just break off leads. Yeah. Um, I would use light. I use a little longer droppers in here. Do you? Yeah. yeah, just a little. You go like 18 or what would They're you do? probably more like 20. Oh, okay. Gotcha. 24. Yeah. They're longer. I, you know, eh. I don't know how much it matters that you're really dragging when you're talking about how far two feet is. Yeah. <laughs> like, dude, if he wants it, he can see two feet. I mean, if I can oh, see, yeah. if I can see five feet. Yeah. And I got five, six rods out there. Yeah. If I can see five feet down. There's no way a fish can't see my stuff. If he wants to come get it, he'll probably come get it. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And then how often do you have one that like, you know, that rod's like 10 feet down and you've trolled over a ledge and you're at 30 feet of water and you look over it. <laughs> boing, boing, you're like, it's gone. Sometimes they're just 10 feet down. I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's just a lot of time. And like I said, but I bet you that bait on that rod that was ten foot down was still exactly perfect. Oh yeah, it wasn't a crappy bait. It didn't, you know, had all its scales. I hadn't like, maybe it wasn't exactly where I'd wanted it at that exact moment of the day that it got bit. But I'll bet you every other detail, the bait, the scent, mm. the hooks being sharp, you know, the you know with the right leaders. I bet all that stuff was perfect. You yeah, know? yeah. And then the intangible is obviously running into a fish. Right, right. And you got to put it in front of them. And these ones are the worst because you can put it right in front of them and they still don't bite. <laughs> That's why yeah. I like steelhead fishing. They freaking yeah. bite. Yeah. That's why live scope would be a killer. You'd sit there and look at fish all day. And just, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Live scope. Uh, I haven't done it yet. I haven't pulled the trigger. I'm going to. I've been on it. You know, it's just just for, basically for entertainment value. I think I'm going to do it for yeah. fun, especially yeah. in the fall. It'd be really cool oh, in yeah. the fall. Yeah. But there's some other really cool applications for it. But at the same time, yeah, I think it's going to be kind of drive you a little crazy sometimes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's get into the nitty gritty of this. So we're going to start with kind of your idea of explaining the Multnomah channel and kind of like what it is, where it's located. We'll get into that and then we'll get into more of the fun stuff. So basically the channel is just the backside of Savi's Island. Mm-hmm. It's the Willamette. Right. Um, you know, a half, three quarters of the Willamette pours in at Rocky Point. Mm-hmm. And then this little ribbon of water that's about 20 miles long that runs Highway 30 right here from basically Linton to uh, St. Helens. This is just, you know, it's little, it's smaller, so it definitely necks it down a little bit. And right. it's shallow in a lot of areas, so that puts them in a box even more. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, I don't know what percentage of them go through the channel versus go around the island and go in that That's way. That's something I've been curious about in the past, yeah. I've had so many people through the years be like, oh, high water years, they go in the <laughs> low water years. They're like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know, man. I don't know how you test that or check that theory. I don't know. Yeah. I do know that when it's really, really, really high in here, they pin to the sides really well. and Yeah. Which yeah. would make sense that on high water years, more of them would go this way because they would be pinned to the side in the Columbia and then right, therefore right. take the first first door in instead of the second door. Yeah, yeah, instead of skipping across it and, and then going around. So, yeah, so yeah. I would think they would just come in at the bottom. That would make more sense to me. Plus, you'd have more flow coming out of here on rivers, years with more water. So right, right, that right. would make more sense. But yeah, I don't know. Um, I just know that a lot of them come through here and it, I've seen some really good days, but mm-hmm. it's never like... I mean, this is a work fishery. It's a it's a sleepy fishery. It's easy as far as like you're trolling simple. It's a great coffee fishery. Sit by the heater. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're trolling herring ninety percent of the time. Most guys in here, maybe some other stuff, but most of the time you're you're trolling herring and you're putting in your time and you're paying attention to your rod and you're watching your depth finder and you're trying to stay right in that ballpark, right near the bottom. Yeah. yeah. And you know, 
just trying to do all the things right. So when you do get the opportunities, you get to capitalize. And some days you're just totally like, I mean, I hate to admit it because I've been here my whole life, but there's been days where I'm like, man, I've stared at my rods for eight hours with six <laughs> rods out and I've just cannot catch one. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I had a day last year. I, sp- I had 10 one morning in here last year. 10 rods? No, I had 10 fish. Oh, okay. Gotcha. No, I mean, I had 10 freaking, I killed like five, let two go, wow. killed five, wow. missed a few. Yeah. I mean, we had wow. an absolutely lights out morning. Um, but I mean, that was just one of those days. Like I just knew, right. I found a little thing and there was a little hump and it was 200 yards long. And I just kept, they were, they're going over it. And I went over it 35 times. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. I, and that was where they were. And that just happened to be the right spot that day. Yeah. Um, and that just, that just comes back down to kind of the attention to detail and knowing your electronics is a big part of it too, you know? And, uh, and being able to find those fish in that 200 yard stretch and just beat up on, you know? Yeah. And just stay, you know, I, I, and taking the time to like, it's kind of sucks to just troll 300 yards and pick back up and do it again, or four or 500 yards. It's way harder than just doing three, four mile downhillers, but it's a lot of effort. But yeah. you, all right, guys, you know, your clients got to be on point, not rip baits off every time they set them in the boat to run back up, not yeah. rip them off, putting them back out. You know, like, um, one thing that I do that I don't know if it's a game changer, but it helps for two different reasons. I have little glass dishes in my boat. Okay. So I have my clients set their bait in these little glass dishes that I can wash. Yeah. Well, I usually take them and I'll put, you know, most of my herring are probably cured roughly the same or fresh, but they're cured the same, mm-hmm. but I can put different scents in each little dish. Okay. So every gotcha. time they set them in there, they're putting, you know, maybe it's not a lot, but they're putting a little bit of something on them. Well, a, it keeps my boat clean. Right. Cause I don't have slimy herring laying in my gunnels. Yeah. And B, it doesn't get stink on them. Right. You know, it doesn't get whatever's in the tray from the day before, so, you know, cause I wash those dishes pretty easy to wash glass, you know, yeah, it picks yeah. right off. And then, uh, you know, then I can mess with different scents Yeah. and I can have, Maybe I have one herring, but I might have four different scents and six rods. And I mean, I'm not, it's not rocket science. If somebody gets bit twice, I'm going to switch it and put <laughs> a couple of those out there, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I think a lot of times you just a matter of getting in front of the right fish, a yeah. lot of it. But still, I mean, there's just, that, that's a little thing, but it, it saves me time cleaning my boat. It's well, easier the, to the, clean those dishes. The little things matter. The little things matter, you know? But, uh, and you know, there's also being a little smaller system like it is, there are, there are quite a few benefits to fishing in this area in terms of it, it's got the same rules that the Willamette river does. Um, you yeah. want to go into some of those differences differences compared to the Columbia? Well, that's one of the biggest things why I barely fish at Columbia if, unless I have to, unless they're just pounding them. Yeah. I'd rather be in here because unless I have six guys or, you know, five, five four or five, six guys, full boats, mm-hmm. um, you know, I don't have to fish all my rods in here. If I got two guys and they buy their endorsement, two of us can, you know, three of us can fish six rods. Right. right. And more importantly, we can all, we can fish barbs. Yeah. And, you know, I know a lot of guys go two for, you know, five in the Columbia. That is totally regular. It's not anybody's fault. They're just springers are hard to catch, but I don't loop. I don't miss nearly as many in the channels I do in the Columbia. And that's because we get to use barbs. Gotcha. For sure. You know, and I think I, I would definitely actually, I don't think I'm safe for, I don't, think, I don't know. Somebody might debate me on this, but I'll tell you, I catch way bigger fish in the channel than I do in the Columbia on average. Okay. Most gotcha. of those Columbia fish, a lot of them, I would say, are probably Drano fish, a ton yeah, of them. Yeah. Um, obviously, the Sandy and, you know, other tributaries are getting a lot of them, but a lot of them are going to Drano. Right. And, I'll, you know, if it doesn't take five minutes scrolling around on Facebook and looking at the pictures to realize that most of those fish are 12 pounds, 10, 12 pound cookie cutters. Yeah. yeah. They're awesome fish. They cut like a dream. They're black face, you know, yeah. Columbia Springers. They're just stud ass fish, but they're, uh, I've got, I mean, the handful I've got in the channel, almost every one I've got in the channel this year, with the exception of one, but almost every one of them has been bigger than most of the ones I've seen in the, yeah. had seen on the Facebook posts in the Columbia. And I'm like, and, you know, and I had six rods and barbs. Yeah. And yeah. one of them, I remember specifically, it swam around on Slack line for a while and probably would have fallen off if we didn't have barbs on it. So yeah, I'll yeah. take it, you know? Yeah. Well, so, it, it's a two fish limit in here also, isn't it? And it's a two fish limit. If yeah. you, uh, we'll, if, we'll, if you can we'll get worry them. about that later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have guys, as soon as we get one, man, if we get one first pass, I can't tell you how many times we'll have like four guys in the boat first pass we get one and they're like hey is it a two fish limit how many do we get i'm like well yeah we get my two so we have we need nine more and then we'll worry about like <laughs> yeah okay guys but look dude if we get nine more we're not getting yeah we're yeah. quick you, you, buy, you buy a lottery we're ticket. going straight to the bar <laughs> it's gonna be an awesome day we're gonna we're gonna have a drink you guys are buying dinner we're gonna we just had the best day ever on the channel yeah yeah no but kidding it can happen but yeah man this is it's just these springers are like so this is kind of funny I was talking to somebody about this last year, one of my other guide buddies, I think it was Evan Lafke. Mm-hmm. We're like, if you go kill seven fall Chinook and you go talk to your guide buddies and everybody's like, yeah, good job. Like, nice work. Got your job done today. Good job. You right. know, like 
you got two springers today. Like people actually care. <laughs> if Evan gets like seven springers or seven fall shark, I'm like, good job, Evan. Like you got seven springers. That's awesome. You know what I mean? Like, or seven, excuse me, seven fall fish. Like, yeah, a lot of us do. There's a lot more of them and it's, but these things are such a bigger prize. Oh yeah. And they're yeah. harder to get. There's fewer of them and they're just, God, they're so pretty that those big purple backs, mm-hmm. you know, it's pretty obvious the difference between not all of them, but most of them is really obvious the difference between the Malamut fish and the Columbia fish. Right, right. The you snow know, bellies and stuff. Purple, purple backs. Yeah. Big, wide, they're, they're wider. These Malamut fish are wider. Um, a lot of those Columbia fish are longer and skinnier, but they're really black face. I mean, you know, not, I've caught plenty of the Columbia fish in here. Yeah. yeah. Also some strays. But it's pretty funny when you do get in. And I've had it happen a handful of times. But you have two of them laying in the box right next to each other that yeah. are not the same. And you're like, oh. Yeah. Oh, those are way yeah, different. Looking. Yeah. Those don't even look like the same critter. Yeah. That's one thing that helped me kind of understand the difference between the two is seeing a picture. I don't remember. Who, it might have been an addicted picture. I don't remember. But somebody had posted a picture of one next to the other. And I, it's posted, like, oh. I posted one a couple years ago. Nick, there was it, two it, of them laying there yeah. in the boat. And they're yeah. not the same fish. Yeah. It could have been yours. But as, lo- as looking at it and seeing the differences. Oh, OK. I get yeah. it now. I get it. One's now. torpedo, black face, yeah. you know, just a different looking critter. Um, but yeah, those, I don't know. I think they're both pretty, obviously the Columbia fish have a little more fat, I think, and they cut really, really nice. But I mean, pfft, those springers, we have a fish cut awesome too. It's, yeah. I'm going to yeah. eat one tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Um, so you had said that this is like a 20 something mile stretch of river. I think it's 20 miles. Yeah. Yeah. Go, go into detail a little bit, how you kind of break down the channel versus like, you know, there's certain sections like Santosh, mm-hmm. um, Coon Island, Gilbert, uh, down, what's that lower section? What do they call it? Is that the Harbor? What do they call that area? The bottom, the bottom. So yeah. I just call them the flats, the flats. The okay. Boise, yeah. The flats, of, you know, just that big long flats. And then you basically have the mill, right? When right. you talk about the mill, essentially you're talking about after the flats drop off and it's 45 feet deep and you're all yeah. the way to the deadline. Gotcha. Um, Okay. And I, there's days, that's the thing. I mean, just that boring frog water, you put them down 20 on the counters and troll through there. I mean, that I know some guys that get them in there. That's where they start their mornings. Yeah. yeah. You know, I would. I haven't done this enough. I haven't done it enough because I'm just a creature of habit like most of us. But yeah. I think if a guy started there at gray light a lot of times and, and made his first few passes there, especially if you had like a big flood incoming tide, like why not? They're pushing it out of the Columbia. You're the first thing they see. Right. No one's been fishing downstream of you because the Columbia is closed when that happens. So yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of things that line up to tell you that you're going to be in a good spot if you go buy one. Um, So basically that flat, you know, if we're going to go from the bottom up as far as like breaking down each section, because you were kind of talking about wanting to do something kind of like that, Mm -hmm. that flat is awesome because it puts them in a box, right? They're right down the bottom. It's shallow. It's not overly narrow there. It's not really wider or narrower than anywhere else, Um, but it's shallow. And so, you know, you're giving yourself the best chance to be near one because there's just not as big of a box for them to hide in. I've had some really good days in those flats. I've just ground out some days down there because I'm like, you know what? I haven't seen Jack caught all day Yeah. for by anybody. It's just been poor. But if one goes through, I'm going to have my best chance at him in here and dinged one at one o'clock <laughs> on my 17th pass. Cause I'm like, yes, you know, yeah. like just cause I just tried to give myself the best odds as long as I could and kept my stuff right. And, yeah. um, I mean, sometimes it's two thirty, and sometimes it doesn't happen anyway, you know, just whatever. But, you know, you got to give yourself the best chance. That flat is killer like that. Santosh is slick because it's narrower mm-hmm. and it's an inside kind of a big inside bend. Yeah. yeah. So it does tend to, you, you know, just out of you think that they tend to kind of put them on the, that inside half of the river making the corner. I don't know how true that really is or how many of them just swim around, but it's a great troll. Mm-hmm. Um wavers a little bit the bottom kind of moves a little in there so you kind of got to pay attention the only thing i dislike about santosh personally is when it gets a lot of traffic in here like when the columbia is closed um because it's narrower the boat wakes are gnarly oh, yeah yeah and it just you're it, you can't help it it's not nobody's fault it's not yeah. like but there's so many boats running up your boat's rocking and man i can't I, I can tell you for a fact i can think of at least a half a dozen times where i've had a rod start to get bit and hit a boat wake and watch it just stop yeah Jeez. I do not think that they bite very well when your boat's rocking. Yeah, yeah, so for sure. I think that's a little hard part about Santosh. Um, that's one thing I love about Coon is you know the majority of the run or the majority of that troll, you're protected by the island. Yeah, half the troll, you're protected by the island. And then, you know, the guys that aren't dicks <laughs> stop and, you know, motor up from the bottom of Harlow's or, you know, from the bottom of the boathouse there at Harlow's or on the right. Right. And you can run up a little bit. You know, and if there's nobody there, sometimes in the afternoon and there's no one trolling, you can cut to the Savi side and run up away from the houseboats, and I don't think you're hurting anything. You're a couple hundred feet off, and you're 400, 500 feet off the dock, so yeah, yeah. you're obviously legal. But, um, man, <laughs> guys go ripping through there first thing, like when the, especially when guys are coming up in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Guys are running up. They want to get to the top of the troll in the morning, and 15 boats are already coming down, and they rip right through the middle of everybody. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> dude. Yeah. Because the thing is, 
this is why the channel turns off and I don't care what anybody says. I've watched this my whole life, the amount of people that are here and not to talk shit. Cause I don't, you know, it's not their fault, but the Washington guys, there's way more Washington guys than there used to be. Yeah. Cause oh, they yeah. don't have anything. I'm really... one of them. Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> not your fault. It's the closest thing to fish when the yeah. Columbia is closed. Yeah. Unless you go fish a Cowlitz. Right. Or you're Lewis. But if you want to troll a big boat and do the big river thing, this is your best bet. And mm-hmm. it's not hard to run across from BBs or, uh, Lake river. Um, yeah. Yep. Ridgefield. Ridge... Yeah. Thank you. Ridgefield. Yep. Um, you know, you can run across from there. Heck, you can run across from the one down there at Lions Day. The sandbar down there, the guys launch at and yeah, run yeah, up yeah. if you needed to. Yeah. But when guys start running over them and it's 12, 14, 16 feet deep. Yeah, turns them off. Yeah, it's a 300. I mean, we have 250, 300 horsepower motors. I mean, if you've ever been underwater, listen to one of those motors. It's loud. <laughs> you know, and I know that they don't all do it. And they're probably, there's dumb fish. We've all got a story about when we watch, you know, swim through the prop wash and eat a herring. Yeah. But, um. I think on average, it's kind of makes them harder to catch when they're getting run over. I mean, if you ran over, if you were on the Lower Wilson and you ran over a hole that was 12 feet deep, yeah. 13 feet deep, and with a 300 horse, you wouldn't expect to catch a fish in there for an hour. Yeah. And we got 40 of them running up and down the channel the whole time. Like, that makes it harder. And I don't care what anybody says. Yeah. When sure. I was a kid, there was not very many boats trolling around. Yeah. And 90% of them were trolling in circles when you would start their big motor a lot of times. Yeah. Especially yeah. on the slock, soft tides or slack tides. Yeah. That's something I never even considered or thought about is, oh, is having those big motors over that motors. short. Yeah. It's the motors. The motors turn it off. It's not the boats. It's not the pressure necessarily. Maybe the pressure of the boats pushing down screws with them. I don't know. I'm not a fish. Yeah. But I guarantee you the motors. Right. Running back and forth. And the boats rocking, trying to keep your gear straight. Uh, just it makes them way harder to catch. Yeah. So that's a tough one. When this gets really busy, um, you know, it can be really long days. One of the perks of the long days is you got your good bites in the morning. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes you'll get a pretty good bite in the afternoon, too, because a lot of the pressure will die down. And you might if you grind it out to two, three, four o'clock, sometimes you'll get one super late gotcha. because they kind of settle down. A lot of, you know, three quarters of the boats will be gone by, you know, noon one. Most guys wear out. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Some of the fishing guides stick it out and fish a little longer, fish a little harder. But a lot of guys wear out. I mean, heck, I did. When I grew up here, I never fished past 11 or 12. Yeah, yeah almost never i just i know when i catch 90 percent of them you know yeah so um the boats the boats hurt so anyway um we're talking about that so you make the count you make the corner at santosh you run up here at the gilbert um that gilbert troll with we call it the brown house gilbert whatever that whole another big inside bend super even bottom it's like 18 feet for like a mile and a half great okay. troll caught a lot of fish there mm-hmm. it's wide i've caught them against the pilings i've caught them in the middle there i mean there's no like real rhyme or reason in that one that i can tell i've kind of caught them all over yeah um that's an easy one and then you have the whole flat below uh coon island which is basically the we call it the eagle's nest or the pipes there's some pipes that come off the the savvy side in the water but there's some big flats in there um you know you just you just grind them it's snaggier than heck in there yeah you really got to stay on your stuff pay attention to your graph i a lot of times i'll just say everybody reel up two cranks yeah because i just know there's a big blob or something down there that's been packing my lunch all year yeah. <laughs> and i didn't miss it you know what i mean i can see it on my graph so you know and sometimes I, I get snagged a lot you know i fish a little longer droppers and i use a lot of lead yeah not like a lot as far as more weight i mean i have a lot of leads with me <laughs> i break off a lot of lead my little thing for my my dropper line is right there oh yeah yeah and i break off a lot of them um it sucks it's just nature of the beast yeah uh and then you got basically once you get above harlow's you know the whole coon island stretch like you were saying mm-hmm. super shallow really narrow box at coon that's yeah. why that's good yeah so it really puts them in a box um and it's protected so you don't have the boat wakes for a little section and it can be protected from the wind a lot of times yeah right at the tail of coon it gets windy again but sometimes on kind of the nastier days it's always smooth in there so you control real well yeah uh, the section in front of harlow's is cool and then you got basically if you run up from there you I know, feel like that's kind of where a lot of people will stop, you know, yeah. like they'll, they'll run that lower section up to Coon. And then I personally, I don't think I've ever fished past Coon. I, I usually, I think I just kind of go past it. Oh, we got a helicopter. I know. It's picking up to sound like crazy. Yeah. I, was like, I, was, I thought it was a boat. <laughs> I thought it was a motorcycle. No, this guy was zipping around the other day. There's a helicopter all day while I was trolling. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't know what he was doing. I've never seen one. Like they was there all day long. Oh, that's crazy. I don't know. Yeah. Don't know whatever. Yeah. So anyways, that, that upriver end of Coon there or whatever. So you go around, there's a section we call the boom. Mm-hmm. big long boom a bunch of pilings that have kind of burned down now but and then the shack um, right above that there's a little inside corner just down from uh, where brown's landing is the other little boat launch in there right. it's kind of a crappy launch but if you got guys that can help you it's it's a good spot right um but brown's there's a good spot at willow and then you have you know that's really just around that corner right so that's just downstream from here we're at rocky point right here mm-hmm. um this is a pretty cool spot this is usually less occupied you kind of got to be careful because of houseboats so you really need to make sure you're pinned all the way to the other shore if you're running through here mm-hmm. um but right now 
<clears throat> it's probably 25 to 35 feet deep in the middle right here. Okay. It's not a very good box as far as um, trying to put force a fish into a corner or spot. It's, yeah. it's deep. That being said, sometimes in the afternoons or those days where it's just crazy busy at Coon, and I'm like, this is stupid. Yeah. I'll run up here just to try and get away from the pressure a little bit and just make these big long runs. And I know that I'm in deep water and I'm kind of, you know, trying hard. But what I figure is, you know, if I go past a fish, at least he didn't just get run over. Right, right, right. And I don't think they remember very long. I mean, I think they make like two corners in here and they forget that they got run over. They'll, they'll, they'll calm down and bite again. Yeah. And then from here up, you go around about two more corners and you get to the little boat ramp on Savi's and I don't even know what it's called. Mm -hmm. And then Savi's Island bridge. Um, that's a huge no wake zone. That's the only section of the channel that's like actually no wake. You can't, right. but there's some really good trolls in there. A couple of really good little flats inside corners. Um, and then you're at the head of the channel mm -hmm. and everybody knows that's a good one because right there, you got the opportunity to get the fish that came up the channel and the ones that came in at Kelly point. Right. So you're kind of that little rim on the edge of the mouth of, you know, the mouth of the channel there, the head of the channel, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. That little rim's a killer troll. Yeah. Um, well, I'm spot. sure you get some Columbia stragglers in there too on occasion. Probably. Yeah. And then, uh, I don't really go down and fish around the mouth very much. It's super pretty deep down there. There's a little bit of an edge mm -hmm. on the Savi side. You can stay at a good troll depth, but it's a lot deeper, wider, kind of a wider box. Um, you know, a lot of guys pro troll that that starts to get in that deep water. It's pretty, it's, you know, pretty good pro troll. And if I go up there, that's usually what I'm doing. Right. Um, yeah. And then from there, shoot, then you just go upstream to St. John's and then it's, you know, waterfront park, spaghetti factory, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, Selwood, all that stuff. You just keep going up till you get to the falls. So yeah. that's, that's kind of the, you know, breakdown of the Willamette. But as far as the channel is concerned, um, you know, those, that area in the lower end, you have more opportunities in a box right shallower right. water newer fish and you know way more pressure because the washington guys well they, why would they run far you know <laughs> they're just coming down from that end anyway and scapoose bay is the best ramp down there by a mile oh yeah it's a yeah. really nice boat ramp so everyone comes up from there as long but, as you don't have ski boaters and stuff stoving it up yeah usually not until the afternoon you know yeah. most of us are in the morning guys so yeah, yeah. usually on the way out in the afternoon you catch a few but you know you also might catch a boat full of girls coming, so that's not terrible. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> it's not the worst thing to do at the end of your day. Yeah, that's right. So you just kind of broke down the whole channel into sections. How do you go about deciding where you're going to start your morning on like a given tide set? So say you got a big flood or you got an incoming, or I'm sorry, a big flood or a big ebb. You know, it's how do you decide where you're going to start every day? Um uh, <sighs> I don't look at the tide chart that much in the channel. Okay. What I like to do is I like to fish the changes. Okay. So yeah. I like to be somewhere that I really like at the tide changes, yeah. Um, yeah. especially low slack. But I would say, you know, that first pass around Coon Island, I always like. Everyone likes that because it's narrow. Yeah. Those fish will bite first thing when they're in there. Sometimes they're laying in there and that's, you know, you'll see a lot of days where you'll see a handful of fish caught right away. Uh, so a lot of times from here, it's a seven minute run. Mm -hmm. Um, it takes me seven minutes to get to that top of that troll. So it's not very long. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I can zip right down there, start at the top of that troll, watch my dad roll out of the marina, drop in right next to him. Sometimes I screw with him and drop in right in front of him and make him go around <laughs> me. And he just looks at me all pissed. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> or even when I was running up for the bottom, sometimes I'll see my dad flip right in front of him or somebody else in the marina. I'm like, mm. and they're like, oh, they just look funny. at, they just look at me like you, you dick. <laughs> like, that's funny. But, uh, no, I try not to pick on dad. He's, <laughs> but dad's, dad's a really good fisherman. And the cool thing about having my dad out there is he fishes just about every day. Yeah. So I usually got a pretty good idea what, what happened the day before. Yeah. Yeah. You got your own report. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's super cool. And he doesn't like the internet. Oh, he does not like the internet. He doesn't go and write anything or whatever. I just call him. and. Yeah. But it's kind of funny. Guys will call me and ask me, hey, what's your dad see this morning? Because <laughs> they know yeah. he's fishing. Like, my buddies that know my dad, a lot of my friends know my dad. And so he's out there doing his thing. And but yeah, there's a lot of the dudes down there at Harlow's that are first pass. That's a pretty good spot to be a lot of times first thing in the morning. It's pretty hard to beat that regardless of the tide. Right. Um, I would say on the out, I think I do better on the outgoing tide in here just because I think it puts them, kind of forces them to the bottom just a tiny bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've had some really good incoming tides, some I mean, weirdly good tides, um, really good days. Yeah. I remember one day a couple of years ago, uh, it was like March. It was one of my first trips of the whole year, and I went out just for fun. With a couple guys, we went out like 10, and it was a flood tide. There was like six boats total, mm. and I mean, everyone had like four. I oh, had like really? I had like five or six tries. And yeah. It was like an afternoon, and we were just, oh, no one started their big motors. Yeah, Everyone was just trolling in this big circle, and there was only like five or six boats, and everybody was hooking them. Yeah, And I just couldn't help but think. I was like, it's because no one's starting their motors. Yeah, <laughs> And when the ones that are going by are biting, you know, and there's nobody here. Yeah, And it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon in March, and it was like, surprisingly good i mean i saw 15 fish caught by five boats and i had like five or six tries yeah i mean that's 
that was, that's pretty good channel fishing, you know? Yeah, yeah. I but, should title this should title this podcast episode, uh, PSA, keep your fucking motors off, you know? Oh, God. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's nothing you can do about it. You got to run back up. I mean, yeah, there's yeah. no way around it. It's just what it is. But, yeah. you know, it was kind of laugh when you see, like, uh, Ryan McCon was his girlfriend, uh, whose name I'm suddenly spacing. She's super cool. Melissa. Melissa. But she, yeah. Melissa was putting that sign up at uh, Drano and saying, yeah. like, go faster. <laughs> that cracked me up. Like, oh, yeah. If everyone went, like, half a mile an hour or a mile an hour faster, it'd be better. But you can't make everybody do it. Yeah, you know? yeah. But, God, I saw that on Facebook, and I was like, that is one of the best things I've seen this week. Like, yeah, that's Melissa hilarious. Melissa just holding up a sign, because Ryan flies. If oh, you yeah. fish around Ryan very often, yeah. you can drop into the top of a path next to Ryan, and you look back, and Ryan's 200 yards in front of you. <laughs> and you look back again, and he's gone. You're just like, oh, shoot, I'm Ryan's going like six yeah <laughs> but he's, then you see him turn sideways and get his net out so you're like okay yeah. well what he's doing is working yeah he's a man on a mission yeah he's good at it he, he flies yeah but anyway um yeah i mean it's just hard those motors i think make it tough yeah. but uh as far as the tides and places i think the days that i've done best are usually the outgoes and mm. you know if in a perfect world for me i'd have an outgoing tide at daylight and probably a change at like nine gotcha okay because then i get to fish the end of the outgo and then that tide change uh and then uh you know, after that flood, you know, then I'm going to just kind of get lazy. Mm-hmm. I'm probably not going to hug the bottom quite as well. Yeah. I'm going to just be in there somewhere and try and get lucky, try and make sure my, like we were talking before, my baits are all perfect. My flashers are all clean. All my stuff's the way it is. And when I do get the opportunity after that, you know, on that flood, hopefully one runs into my stuff and gets fired up and grabs one. So, right, right, right. Um, so this thing gets blown out pretty pretty darn easy with the rain and stuff from the willamette and um so on and so forth how does the turbidity affect how you target them in here do you hug, do you hug any closer to the bank do you um do you, do you run plugs in here at all uh just kind of go about how turbidity affects you so the turbidity thing um here's a little trick for the turbidity thing and i probably shouldn't even tell you this but that turbidity meter at uh ross island bridge or whatever uh, morrison morrison bridge yep. it, that turbidity meter is a couple days before it reaches here. Right, right. So you got a couple days. If that thing spikes, you still get like a day or two. Um, So that's pretty cool. You got to kind of know that. Yeah, but But it also takes a day or two longer to clear up. It takes wash out. Yeah. Um, For me, man, if I can see my kicker, yeah. If I can see my prop, you know, my kicker, I'm, I feel like I'm doing just fine. It's enough turbidity for me. Right. It's, it's clean enough. I want to say I think 14. Mm-hmm. I can't remember. I think 14 is like about the line where it's like about perfect or about to be good enough to go. Right. I think I probably – I know for a fact I've caught them at more than that because yeah. I've just gone fishing because I was going fishing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I've caught them in some crappy conditions. Um, if I was to do anything different for as far as the turbidity, I would shorten my leader between my flasher and my herring. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, we fish – Pro Trolls, 20 inches. Yeah. Shoot, I've seen some <laughs> guys have 15 inches. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They're right behind just, your flash. And it's whipping around. You're like, no, they can, they're not afraid of that triangle. Yeah. So if yeah. you want to run one two feet, you know, and just get a little closer and maybe fish a brighter color because you got, you know, you got, um, they just can't see it as far. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would totally do that. Yeah. That's one thing I do. I'll just cut my leader right at the top of the swivel and just retie it. And I know if, I know if they're, if it's going to be dirty, a lot of times I just shorten them up. Yeah. Heck of a lot easier to net them. Yeah. <laughs> it's oh, nice. yeah. It's nice when you get one. Yeah. You land them. Yeah, um, absolutely. But as far as the turbidity, now, the difference between turbidity, turbidity and height are a lot different. Right, right. So turbidity can screw you up. This thing can be borderline flooded. Yeah. Like 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 the dike almost flooded over there. Yeah. And still be plenty clean enough, like four or five feet of visibility and flooded because of Columbia floods. It gets high. You know, they open those dam – or they open the, da- the dam – this thing picks up, it starts backing up, the current dies, um, you know, and I don't know if it'll happen this year because we don't really have that much snow. Right. So I don't think this year we're going to see a bunch of high water in here. Yeah. Um, what do I know? But I'm, <laughs> I'm going to guess it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. But I mean, when it gets, but that's when you can start anchor fishing and start doing, start doing high water stuff. Okay. And there's a lot of places in here that you can paste them on anchor. Yeah. You can really put them, that's the other reason they get put in a box is, you know, you put them in a box because they're not going to be in the edges. They're, excuse me, they're not going to be in the middle. They're going to push to the edges. Yeah. And there's a handful of little ambush points in here that are worth putting plugs out and sitting on. I seldom do it, but I have, and I have had some pretty good success. Mm-hmm. I've completely missed and been on the wrong one and just not touched them. And I've had days where I was like, I was on the exact right spot and hooked like six or seven of them on a quick fish. Yeah. yeah. And I don't like to do that very often, but there's definitely a time for it. Right. Um, 
years ago we had, a, and I'll never remember the year, but a few years back we had a great big flood. I had a friend of mine tell me that he landed 17 one day oh, here. Geez. In here? In here. Oh, man. And he said he broke off like 23 flashers or something stupid. Because oh, he was trolling in like three feet of water in everything that's currently sticks. Yeah. And he was murking them. They were in there, but he's like, I couldn't go 10 feet without getting snagged or I get a fish, but I just kept doing it because I was getting, I was hooking them. Yeah. yeah. He's breaking, and then you just wait for the water to drop and then you just go collect all your flashers <laughs> off the trees. <laughs> yeah. You just got to make sure you beat everybody else out there. Yeah. The one thing you've got to pay attention to in here that you got to be a little more careful about is because of uh, Boise in the years past, there's used to be log rafts. It's, mm. People ask me all the time when I'm working, hey, how come, like, why are there all these log rafts? There's log, there's you know logs everywhere. These pilings. Well, when I was a kid, these were all log rafts. There's thousands of logs. This whole thing was just stuffed. Do you remember that, that when we were little? Bastard. Oh, that's yeah. They're right there. Middle <laughs> sea line right there off the dock. Yeah. But this thing, especially the lower end by Boise, there was thousands and thousands and thousands of logs. Yeah. So, what that did is it created less places for us to be able to fish, which probably let more fish get away. Realistically. Right. 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 And look at him. Yeah, he was just hanging out. Fuck that guy. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, I watched him thrash like four of them the other night. Oh, I'm just sitting here on my porch and he's just trashing them, dude. He's he's a problem. Yeah. I will yeah. I will say I'm not super pumped on this and I don't even really want to say this, but it's true. <laughs> I've seen way more sea lions in here this year than I ever have. Have you? Yeah. yeah. And I feel like it, that's a story everywhere though. Well, everywhere yeah, this year. It's usually not as bad in here. Yeah. And it's always worse early because the smell the majority of the fish, you know, sea lions come up and the smelt come and then Later in the year, I think a lot of them move up towards the dam, and they're kind of out of here. Yeah. I don't see nearly as many towards, like, May and June and later in the year, but um, there's a lot more now. And yeah. I will tell you that that will screw this up fast. Yeah. If there's one or two of those in here, and he's also in that shallow water box that you're trying to fish. Yeah, it'll shut a bite off. I don't even think this shuts them off. I think they don't stop. Yeah. I think a lot of times we just they're just flying. They're just trying to get out of there. They're swimming for their lives. Yeah, they're instead in survival of, instead mode. Instead of getting in maybe one of those little dips and just killing for a second, and then, oh, Harry, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, no, I think they're way harder to catch those fish when they're flying like that. And I think those sea lions keep them moving, and I think that's really hard because I've – I've had days where I've seen like five days in a row where I've seen 15 fish caught, you know, in the first hour and a half. And I've come out in the same troll in the morning and there's a stellar, he is dead center yeah. of that troll. Yeah. And I haven't seen anybody hook one. And I'm like, dude, he was there all night. Yeah. Cause he doesn't know. He doesn't care. He's there all night. He's yeah. not like he gets, goes and takes a nap. Yeah. He's been working all night long, man. And they know he's down there. They can hear him or feel him. And he, if they can't, he get he, he gets them. Yeah. Right. Right. But uh, those things are incredibly efficient, and they're they're probably going to be the end of our fisheries if we don't do a pretty dramatic. And it's going to be an unpopular decision. Someone's going to have to make it. But yeah, it's uh, it's going to be the deterrent. I mean, we talk about dams and upper river dams and water things, and there's a million things that hurt fish. Right. But I tell people most of the time, I said I think a lot of that's putting a band aid on a broken arm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that those those things on the ground are eating a huge percentage of the ones coming back, and you know the Alaska. The Pacific Salmon Treaty, the number of fish that get caught up in the Gulf of Alaska and the bycatch from some of the Pollock fisheries and some of that stuff, mm -hmm. they're murdering so many more fish before we even get to them. And then when we get to them, these guys are eating them. Right. But you also don't think, I mean, I watched one at least, I watched at least four sturgeon get eaten the other day while I was fishing. Yeah, and then this year for the first time, we didn't have a sturgeon fishery. In the first couple of years, we didn't have a sturgeon fishery in Astoria. And I'm like, yeah. There's 3,500 sea lions sitting on two docks right here. Well, of course we're done. Right. What do you think these guys eat when there's no salmon? Yeah, yeah. And How, that, that's, just can, as, that's just our story. That's just one that's spot. Even, yeah. If you, if you can catch a – it always blows me away that they can catch a salmon. Yeah. Like, how easy must a sturgeon be to catch? Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, that's always just a – that always just – just kind of gir or just irks fires me. you have. Yeah, I just can't believe we can't do anything about it. I mean, yeah. If you gave us a season, if you gave us a twenty-four hour freaking, if we just had a purge, yeah, twenty-four <laughs> hours, man. Every one of us would put our rods oh, down man. for a day. It'd be the best day of the year. Oh, it'd be killer. I don't care what it would be. Give us bows. Give us yeah. something like sleep. You want to do? You want to do something? Fucking charge out the ass for the licenses. People would pay it, oh, dude. You could make bank amount, one day. Amount of fifty cal on the front of your sled. <laughs> just have the day of your life. Oh yeah, man. I'm like, it's blast. like those pig hunting videos in Texas. Yeah, yeah. But no, I mean, that's just. I think that and that's the other thing because they're not hunted and they don't have any predators. They're not afraid of anything. They're not. It's not hard for them to get up next to your boat. They know you're not going to shoot them. Yeah. And you know they they don't see their dead friends floating down the river very often. I think that would deter them too. They're pretty. Oh, yeah. They're pretty smart. Yeah, yeah. I think if you had a couple of their dead buddies floating by, they would not be super pumped about getting right back up in there. But yeah. Unfortunately, nobody checks with me on these decisions. Right, right. Well, I, I had heard a story, and I don't know. I don't know how factual it is. This is all just hearsay. Um, was it Willamette Falls or was it Bonneville that they were trapping them and taking them, taking the Stellars back down to California and putting a tag in them? They beat the boat back. Yeah, that's what I heard. I was like, "Are you kidding me?" Yeah. Like, oh man, that's insane. Yeah, they're not dumb. No, they know right where not. to go, and yeah. it's and this is 
unfortunately, this is they, they really make it hard. And even if they're not eating them right in front of you, you're then you're not seeing all of them, and you're also not realizing how much of the impact you're fishing. Yeah, they're they're worse on you than all the motors. You know, those things are those fish are afraid of those. Right, right, right. So anyway, that's that. Those suck, but you can't do anything, <laughs> you can't, can't do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. Their hands are tied. Yeah. Um, it's getting a little bit to to water temperature. So, do you find that the channel usually stays a little warmer or colder than the Columbia, or is it just right about the same? Typically, it's warmer That's earlier figured, this time yeah. of year. And right now, it was the other day. My buddy and I, our graphs could be off by a degree. Right. You know, I'm not saying mine's perfect, but it was a warm degree warmer in the Columbia, and yeah. that's probably the lack of snow. Yeah. Um, which probably doesn't bode well for our fall because it's probably going to be 76 degrees. Yeah. yeah um, it'll be warm. But whatever. We'll cross our bridge when we come to it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's usually warmer in the Willamette, and so usually the fishing is better in here than it is in the Columbia early. Right. Uh, that kind of switched, I think, this year by the end of March. So I got a feeling the Columbia is – it's at least the same right now. Gotcha. Um, and those guys in the Columbia the last day or two – I mean – Everyone sees the, like the guy like Teddy today killed four in the Columbia. Like awesome, he's one of my best friends. I love Teddy. Yeah, like great, but like nobody posted the day. You know, there's not there's a hundred guys that didn't kill a fish today out there. Right, right. Or you know, two hundred. Who am I kidding? There's a ton of boats that didn't do very well. So yeah, you know, you just don't see that picture on Facebook very often. Right, right, right. The sunrise. Sun, pitch. sunrise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think one day last year I posted a picture of my empty fish bag and I was like, just realistically, <laughs> like, I got three yesterday. Yeah. This happens. No, absolutely. I had one day last year. I killed five fish with guys, and we had a really good morning. We killed. We killed five. I think we actually missed six. We missed one, and the one we missed was half of a double. Oh, geez. And uh, I told my guys the next day, I go, "This might be a long day, guys." And they go, "Why?" And I said, "I think I used up all my luck yesterday, <laughs> and yeah. I fished six rods for eight hours that day, and I never had a bite." Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, should have <laughs> been here yesterday. Well, yeah. And I was like, I just used up all my luck. I yeah. Mean, yeah, absolutely. So whatever. But no, as far as water temperature, you know, people ask me all the time. And now you and I talked about this before we started. But, you know, guys are like, hey, when do you put on pro trolls? You start pro trolling here. <laughs> and I'm like, when, you know, 55 degrees, you can switch to spinners, switch to prawns. I've heard that my entire life. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I don't. Dude, last year I had one day in here. It was been probably the first week of April. Mm. Columbia was still open. I know that for a fact. Uh, I killed three fish on a size seven freaking Toman spinner in here. Yeah. <laughs> and I. Fish five rods with herring and one with a spinner out the back on one of my back rods because I seldom get bit on my back rods. Right. And I was like, ah, forget it. I used to fish these in high school all the time because we'd have an hour and I didn't want to mess with bait because I was coming straight from baseball practice. So I mm -hmm. just, me and my buddies would throw out two spinners and make one pass or two passes. And yeah. we killed a lot of fish on them. Yeah. So granted, there were more fish around, so, but I know they work. Well, I had one day last year, like I said, I fished all day. We killed three fish. All three of them ate the same spinner. Yeah. I drug that spinner around in the same rod holder for two weeks and never caught another fish on it. Oh, jeez. So, <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah. But as far as the water temperature thing's concerned, people ask me all the time, when do you start pro trolling? Yeah. When I see guys with pro trolls catching fish. Yeah, yeah there's enough, exactly. There's enough guys doing it that you'll see uh, you'll see a couple guys here and there. And I mean, I saw one the other day on a pro troll. Right. But there's enough guys getting them that once you start seeing a few fish getting caught on pro trolls, like, yeah, like... I'll flip one out. I'll put them on my back rods. And yeah. a lot of times I'll put them on my back rods and use a little less lead and just kick them out behind the boat somewhere. Yeah. And I know they're not on the bottom, but they're in the, they're in the ballpark. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, yeah, I seen I seen Casey Kelly got one on a pro troll the other day. Down Casey, there. Casey Kelly's a machine. <laughs> He's automatic. He's yeah. a good fisherman. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. But uh, no, shoot. As, as far as uh, getting dark, as far as like the pro troll water temperature thing, I don't put a ton of stock in it. Right. Um, I'm definitely more concerned about just seeing them. Uh, perk of being like here, I can just rip out there. Like, I mean, if you and I are sitting around right now at six o'clock, yeah. Yeah, I'll get the pro troll. I'll open the pro troll rod locker instead. We'll throw on a couple super baits, right? And maybe go troll this deep water. You know, that's one thing I will say that I'll fish them a lot more this year if I'm up here. Because mm -hmm. um, if I'm just going to fish that deep water, kind of maybe not banging the bottom quite as close, I think they draw fish in from further away. Mm -hmm. And I also think when you got five or six of them, you're creating kind of that schooling effect, and you get a yeah. little bit more action. So there will definitely be some days where I'll go down in the morning and troll around down there and do the program and then maybe zip up here and get out the pro trolls and make my last two or three hours of my day are going to be up here. Yeah. And yeah. just just try and get some – just try and make some noise and see if I can't get one or two more to go. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I've caught – Two fish this year on a super bait behind a triangle. Oh, perfect. And lost another one. Perfect. And I never do that. Yeah. I, John, John Kaiser is going to be thrilled. Oh, yeah. Dude, John's, John's, you know, I told you this before. I called yeah. John. I was like, hey, John, guess what? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Adam's going to be thrilled, too. Adam's always beating my ass about that. Um, I think we're kind of getting down here towards the tail end of it. I got two more questions I want to ask you. Shoot. Um, 
beginner fishermen in the Multnomah Channel, what's one piece of advice that you would give them to try to be successful in here? It's snaggy, it's gross, there's a lot of a lot of pilings, deadheads. One piece of advice that might point them in the right direction to get fish. Fish low slack. Okay, yeah. Fish a low slack tide change. Fish yeah. an hour and a half before low and an hour after that change. Yeah. I, It's not automatic, but there's a lot of days where you might see four fish caught and three of them were in that two-hour window. Yeah, yeah. So if I was just to shoot at the moon and just throw a dart, yeah, that's probably what I would shoot for. Yeah. So right there, fish that slack tide change. Wash your stuff. Yeah. Take lemon joint. Wash your flashers. Wash your gear. I mean, some guys don't care, but like... It probably doesn't affect all of them, but it might affect one of them. Right, right. So, you know, you're really only looking for one. Yeah. You know, worry about the second one later. But, yeah, I would I would just wash my gear, mm-hmm. make sure everything was perfect, be diligent, and then just... Attention to detail. Yeah, be yeah. diligent and, mm-hmm. and try your best. Do the things you know how to do and do it right and, you know, keep it close to the bottom. And But, yeah, if, I mean, just randomly throwing a dart at a board for one little thing, just be out there with that low slack tide change. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, last question here. Your personal favorite way to target these fish in here? Is it just triangle and herring? You yeah. got anything crazy? No, triangle and herring. Mm-hmm. Uh, pro trolls are cool. I did have a couple streaks last year where I was doing well on pro trolls. Yeah. Um, it got good for a while, uh, but, like... I've still got thousands more of them on a, in my entire life. I mean, shoot, when I was a little kid, we fished whole herring, and we, no one used flashers. We no one had triangles when I was a little kid. Yeah, yeah. We'd get these whole herring with nose clips, and we'd try to get these big slow rolls. And, yeah. You know, but, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I, triangle and herring, definitely. And the bites are awesome. Yeah. Oh, they're, yeah. They're such good bites. And yeah. So cool. Yeah, absolutely. Was um, that you that posted a video of one from last year? Oh, man, that was that Western. Was that was that, Western. That was a trip. That one in particular was funny. I didn't – I don't think I got this, but – we were trolling down. I was right in the sixes, and I'd already fallen off the ledge to where it was starting to get deep. Yeah. There was a barge coming up river. Yeah. And I couldn't troll across. Usually, I was going to troll down the Savi side, and I'd cut across or whatever. That was kind of my plan at the start of the troll. Mm-hmm. And uh, this barge was coming across, so I had to troll down my side further than I wanted to. Right. And I kind of fell off the ledge. I was kind of in deep water, deeper. And I was like, eh, whatever. So I trolled across, and it's like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And one of the guys in my boat says something like, hey, barge bite, you know, laugh, <laughs> laughingly. And I literally said out loud, I'm like, yeah, I've trolled the channel my entire life. It's kind of shallow. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that works very well in here. They don't they don't really like the barges. I don't think going over their head. Yeah. And looked up and watched a rod in the front just get plowed oh, as I'm hilarious. in the prop wash behind the barge. And I was like, well, that one didn't care. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> so, oh, man. That that happened. That was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, man, I think, I think we'll go ahead and go for a quick recap here real quick. Um, Obviously, uh, if you like what you're hearing, uh, follow the follow the uh, YouTube, Spotify. Um, what's the other one? Apple Podcast, mm-hmm. and uh, share it out there with your friends. We're trying to grow this thing. We had we had Keith Archer last week. We got Josiah this week. We got some super awesome dudes that are taking time to do this uh, with me, and I appreciate the fuck out of them for it. Um, yeah, you came all the way to my porch. This is awesome. No, no <laughs> yeah. problem, dude. Yeah, yeah. You got to do, do what you got to do. I can do this. Yeah, I did Keith's episode at nine o'clock at night last week, and I drive log truck for a living. I was up at one in the morning to haul logs. <laughs> so you got to do what you got to do. It's a grind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're we're, uh, we're going to restructure the giveaway. Keep your eye out for a post on that. Um, yeah, take a second. Plug yourself. Plug your social medias. Um, any <laughs> any affiliates? <laughs> you, you plug have? yourself. <laughs> no, the uh, the uh, I got a lot of I got a lot of trips uh, coming up. Uh, a lot of dates coming up. There's a lot more. T- People a lot of times say, like, oh, you know, I want to book with you, but I know you're busy. I'm like, well, yeah, but springer fishing is definitely the time of year where it's the least busy. Mm. Um, I'm meeting most of the people down here or picking them up real close to here. It's super relaxed. It's a killer one to do half day trips. You want to get out for just a money morning stuff. I can do that if I got a couple guys, mm-hmm. especially if I got two or three guys, you know, make it worth the time. But um, I, it's just a really nice fishery. It's really easy. It's low key, you know. I haven't needed the heater one time this year. It's been really yeah. nice. I've, I've had the boat every day. Nobody's even bothered touching it. Yeah. No. Um, but low key fishery and the table fare. I mean, I know seats are expensive and everyone's got, you know, kind of pinching these days. No. But uh at the same time, you know, you, you get one springer and it's pretty dang good. I'm gonna cook one tonight for the, on the barbecue tonight. Yeah. Um, they're awesome fish to eat and man, it's a it's a pretty cool accomplishment, you know, when you get one of these guys that are they're right, they're really nice fish. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. How uh how can people get a hold of you to book trips? Oh, most guys hit me up on Facebook. It's okay. easy. Um you know, guys that know me, call me, text me. I don't mind one bit. Mm-hmm. I don't mind if you just text me right off the web. You know, my Jadar Guide to Fishing or Jadar Fishing, uh, gmail.com. Mm-hmm. You can email me. Um, you know, I have a website, Jadar Fishing website. Look it up. 
find my number, call me, text me, whatever. But definitely lots of room. Um, it's going to get a lot better. May mm-hmm. and June are May and June are better than April. Yeah, yeah. Do so, you ever do that upriver <clears throat> stuff, or do you just kind of try to hang out? I'm I'm talking like oh, uh, blood wind and Drano and stuff like hey, that. You gotta have a Washington guides license for that, and I haven't bit the bullet to go do that. Gotcha. Okay. Um, the wind one sucks because for some reason they put the yeah the boundary they put the boundary so far out of the wind that it's like Ugh. yeah but I don't it hurts. I haven't done that but last year I, that that's the other kickers everyone leaves yeah. half these Washington guys aren't going to come in here most of the guys leave and go up there I need those damn counts to jump up and then most of them will go yeah and then suddenly I start doing quite a bit better in here too <laughs> so I usually hang out in here and it's you know just just a dang easy and I live here and you know three quarters of my guys. Are from close enough to here they'd probably rather not drive to drano right you know especially if i got people from columbia county but yeah i mean this is sleepy and easy and man it's low key and if you like to drink a beer in the boat I mean, you're great come do it i can dro- drive you around you know yeah yeah it's an easy 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 fun fishery and i mean i've had some pretty awesome evenings yeah lights out good evenings just two o'clock till dark yeah I mean, there's some good ones. So I'm, I'm available, especially if people want to give it a shot and just do something different and just come ha- come hang out with some friends and have a good time. And yeah. it's uh, there's room. So have yeah. them, and reach out. I'd love to. I'd love to get you out and we'll go have a good time and sit in the nice big boat and troll around and see what we can find. Yeah, that boat's a beauty, man. That boat's a beauty. It's a pretty boat. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have any sponsors you want to shout out or? Shoot, I mean, most of these guys at this point, most of these guys help. You know, Procure always gets me a ton of good stuff. Northwest mm-hmm. Bait Sense, you know, and I. I I'm totally not a snob like that. I pretty much use everybody's stuff. Yeah, you have you know, to. Yeah, well, like the Yak- the Yakima bait, the big owl flashers and stuff. Those are killer. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something I didn't say, and I want to tell you this. You were asking. You were asking before we started about flasher colors. Mm-hmm. I've caught them on just about every color flasher you can think of, and not flashers. Mm-hmm. I mark my flashers when they get bit. Okay, gotcha. It matters. Kind of like plugs. It's kind of like plugs. Runner plugs. Some of them work better. Gotcha. My okay. one that's caught like most of my fish this year, freaking stuck in. With- snagger oh jeez <laughs> no actually it didn't stick to a snake it broke off on a fish oh man it's brutal anyway stupid stupid <laughs> but anyway i'm pissed <laughs> but anyway um <clears throat> there's uh when you get one make a little look at this one see that's called yeah that's yeah. there's a reason that's got a little mark on it gotcha so i just make it doesn't have to be much but as long as it got one or two it's good enough that you know if i gotta pick them yeah but i also notice these ones i put numbers on because mm-hmm. if i get like 10 new ones like jared big jared got me a couple of these from Yakima they're really cool ones well I had like seven or eight of them with the same color and I was like oh, I'm never gonna know which one was which so I just numbered them real fast yeah and yeah. I realized that okay that way when I put four of them out I know which one was the one getting bit right but yeah that matters yeah I mean yeah sometimes I don't know if it's the way they rock and same thing with plugs who knows yeah but there's clearly some of them that get hot yeah and if I when I lose one of those I'm like <laughs> I don't <laughs> lose very many more. flashers I don't lose very many flashers most of the time I use a little heavier bumper yeah but uh yeah those I definitely would uh I definitely would pay attention to ones that get bent and keep fishing those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There is something to that. Yeah, cool. Well, I uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and cool, sitting yeah. down with me tonight. Are you kidding? It's been it's a great, blast, great man. Times. Awesome, it's awesome. Gorgeous, gorgeous weather, gorgeous scenery. Not a bad spot to hang out. I'm going to do it for the rest of the night. I'm yeah. going to get out my barbecue and cook yeah. a Springer. And yeah, absolutely. Try not to throw stuff at that sea lion when he comes back <laughs> up because he's going to come back up. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. So, maybe maybe uh, throw a worm off the porch, catch, yeah. a, catch a catfish. There you go. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> so, awesome. Uh, thank you, everybody for tuning in for another week here of the wet net podcast um you guys have yourselves a great weekend uh tight lines and we'll see you next time all right man see ya see ya